welcome you all to our session nine of the Maine Lung Cancer Coalition Lung Cancer Screening Echo. It is again truly a pleasure to have you all. I can't, like I mentioned at the beginning, some of you weren't here for that, but again, you know, I can't believe it's our last session and it's really been an um, amazing experience and we really appreciate all of you participating in this, this project with us. So next slide. So the usual disclosures in CME. Uh, the speaker today is not having relevant financial relationships with the manufacturer of any commercial products and or provider commercial services discussed in the CME activity. Um, as you all know, the CME evaluation survey will be sent after the echo session via email. Anybody, if you don't need CME, we'd love to have your feedback on every session. So feel free to, you know, again, as we always talk about, you know, fill that out and give us your feedback. And please complete the Survey Monkey uh, within the Survey Monkey within one week. And at the end, a CME certificate will be available for download. Next slide, please. So today, I'm really happy to support um, Teresa Rolke. Um, she's a gerontological nurse practitioner. She's one of our faculty. You're all used to her now um, as we're in, again, our ninth session. And today, we're going to talk a little bit about, and I'm going to um, do some opening and closing, but really, I want to give the bulk of this presentation um, support and credit to Teresa. You know, she is the boots on the ground. She, you know, is the um, program manager for Maine Medical Center Lung Cancer Screening Program. So she uh, knows this work, you know, inside and out. And so um, who better, I think, to kind of, you know, again, like, you know, that was important when we were thinking of faculty, you know, again, so we get programs that are, you know, doing this work every day. So today we're gonna talk about key sustainability components to consider for successful lung cancer screening programs. Next slide. So I just wanted to kind of start off because I think it's just, it's worth taking a minute just to look at all the different didactic topics we have all done together, talked about together, and then as you all know, the case presentations that you have all developed and presented have rolled back into these topics. And then as also you know, we send you, you know, the didactic, we send you the, the recording of that, we send you the slides, we send you the notes, uh, you know, we look at resources related to these topics. So it is also our hope from a programmatic team that you will take all this, this knowledge and work and be able to use this as you move forward and thinking about the next steps in building and growing your programs and for some of you starting programs. So session one, you know, we talked about lung cancer screening 101, right? How to start that implementation phase. We talked about uh, session two is insurance coverage and different other requirements for low-dose CT. Session three, we talked about how to identify and recruit eligible patients for lung cancer screening. Session four, we talked about the shared decision-making um, component within the lung cancer screening process. Next slide, please. Session five, the, the very important integrating tobacco treatment, you know, into lung cancer screening programs and what we're seeing as best practices for doing that and seeing people, you know, being more open to that after having their screening. The scanning process itself with best practices in the lung cancer screening process for access and efficiency. Lung cancer screening, what we do with these results, you know, how we report those results to providers and patients and follow up with that and track that. And then how data can help us talk about low dose, low dose um, screenings, lung screenings, and really, again, looking at how we use data within the quality improvement context to really, again, look at what you're doing, um, where those you know, gaps might be, and how you can continue to grow those programs. Next slide. So this is a really um, nice slide that I've used in, in other um, components, and, and even in kind of when we, Neil and I were kind of building, you know, looking at the didactic and spreading that across time. And, you know, so what we'd like to ask as we go through this, this, this session nine today, for you all to kind of keep these pillars kind of in your mind, okay? Because we're gonna, you know, Neil's gonna facilitate a conversation around the case presentation around these kind of pillars and where you think you're at. So looking at eligibility, education, exam ordering, image acquisition, image review, communication, referral network, quality improvement, reimbursement, and research, and it says frontier. And I think, you know, when Teresa and I were talking about this, it's really research and innovation as well. You know, I think frontier transition, transition <laughs> we can't talk today, translates, there we go, into innovation, right? That is a huge part of all of this work as well. So at this point, for this slide now, I'm gonna uh, let Teresa take over the rest of the presentation. Teresa? Hi there, thanks. Can you all hear me okay? Are you perfect? Good. 
So we're asked to look at, you know, how's Maine Med doing um, as far as the 10 pillars um, that you just spoke of. And so I just put together this little grid here just to look at the 10 pillars and, you know, yes, no, um, are we meeting them or are we working on it? And so, and a bit of the challenges in terms of, you know, in what ways we're trying to work on these things. And so first is eligibility. Um, I think that we're, you know, I checked yes for that because I feel that, um, you know, the, sometimes we have a bit of a challenge with ensuring consistency regarding the patients who are eligible for, for screening. Every now and then we'll get a patient who isn't eligible, but it doesn't happen too often. Um, but again, we're getting better through the education of the ancillary staff and, and patients and providers. Um, so going into the next uh, area, education for the second pillar, working on that. We did start off in the very beginning of the program three years ago, did a ton of outreach to providers, um, to as, as many patients as we could. Um, but the challenge was always reaching rural Maine, which we all know. Um, and one of the things that I found was really awesome in terms of education that I felt really effective was Best, the best scenario was one-on-one, -on -one, but smaller groups, um, you know, of staffing is also pretty darn effective. And one of the things that's really key to uh, include in the education is ancillary staff because they do a pretty good bulk of the work in terms of scheduling the patients and ordering imaging and following up with providers. So, so it's not just the providers, but it's the staffing that supports um, the, the, the office um, and the providers that's important. Um, as far as imaging ordering, you know, I feel like we're doing pretty good. Um, the only thing that I would say is it's just consistency, again, among the, uh, the admin who are entering the orders. That can be a challenge from time to time, but again, with practice, they get better. Um, and we all begin to, you know, speak the, the common language of, you know, ordering and understanding um, how that's done. Imaging acquisition is fine. We're doing fine uh, in that realm. Um, imaging review, we have, are also doing well. We have our matrix uh, weekly meetings on Friday mornings to review the RADS4 findings for patients. Um, and we've got a team of a couple of surgeons, pulmonologists from Chest Medicine Associates, a um, couple of nurses on the NP. So that's um, that's been going very well. Um, we we uh, look at the nodules, not just for the imaging, the lung screening program, but also for incidental findings. Um, next pillar is communication. Uh, again, that's, that's got to be ongoing. Um, and so that's something that's always, you know, you're always um, working to, to strive for that between leadership and the staffing, the admin, uh, you know, the admin, and, and just keeping in line with the program, uh, the goals of the program. Referral network, again, working on. One of the things I was thinking is, you know, what about, you know, what would be the goal for increasing volume by 2025? So if you're five years out, um, and I wondered, would 15% be good? What's 20%? What would be, that would be something that programmers might consider, you know, setting a percentage and thinking about goals, you know, maybe not even five years out, two or three, but, um, you know, that's something that should always be in the back of, of our minds. Quality improvement, again, work in progress, it never ends. Uh, one of the biggest challenges, reliable data systems that we would all hope to have in place in order to query that so that we could actually, um, you know, see what we're lacking and, in, in, you know, what are what is the data showing us in terms of improving our program. Uh, other piece that I think is really important for quality improvement is focus on uh, lung health. and. What I found is if we focus on lung health, it's actually a pretty awesome way to engage patients in screening um, uh, because it, uh, it helps to make the, the program more patient-centered. Um, reimbursement, I feel like we're doing fine in that realm. And then research and innovation, as you had mentioned, um, just uh, always, again, working on that. So thinking about um, what is the research that we could be doing within these programs, and then how can that research translate into innovation? And some of you may know that um, I have a 3D lung nodule model tool that I developed um, to educate patients in clinic on, uh, on lung nodules and sizing so that they would understand, you know, what a three millimeter is, uh, lung nodule is, as opposed to a five millimeter and so on. And this was meant to not only educate, but to help reduce anxiety around uh, the nodules that are so commonly found. So next slide, Annie, um, would be, we're looking at this, building this infrastructure for screening is, is really important. 
Um, one of the things that I think is key is establishing a lung cancer screening committee um, and finding members that are going to be engaged and continue to be engaged. One of the other pieces that's important is thinking about a timeline um, for, for planning that's pretty important in order to get things done. Um, step two, focusing on lung health for um, education and um, focusing on population health. And, and again, that's a way of keeping patients engaged in screening. Um, and then step three, uh, again, focusing on organizational leadership, uh, engaging leadership in a robust way and keeping them engaged. That's really key. Um, I think if uh, you want people who are, um, who are passionate about this, um, and then there's also a mention of the adequate staffing, which is really important, and we know that many programs lack that, and that's one of the biggest challenges. Uh, next slide, please, Nanny. Uh, step four, database. <laughs> this has always been a challenge, um, uh, but it's, it's worth it. Um, and again, if we, can, if we have reliable uh, database, uh, the data is entered reliab reliably. Um, then you you have when you create you're you're going to end up with some some good information and that will help to improve um, and build programs. Uh, one of the things that I feel as far as uh, databases is when they're going to be built, I feel like you've got to hire people who know what they're doing and they're experts in it. That's pretty important. Um, next uh, step five: uh, collaborative partnerships, um, which is what. Actually, Neil, you mentioned early on in the session, that's really, really important um, because if we work, you know, again, we're a rural state, we're working collaboratively, um, we're helping, the goal is to improve access to, to the screening. And then the other piece too is, um, you know, it's one thing to have access to screening, but what about the positive findings? What about the threes and fours? How do smaller programs manage those? Um, and that, that can be done in collaboration. Um, step six, ongoing education. I feel like it never ends. Um, and I think that, you know, you're constantly, even if you feel that you've, you've educated one small group, you sometimes have to go back and, and redo or redo bits of it. And that's okay because eventually people will own it. it it's just, you know, I feel like it, lung screening is a work in progress. Um, so, as I, I would say, as I said, it's not just the clinicians, it's the ancillary staff, and it's also the patients. So, continuous um, education. And I think that's it for what I have, Jess. I think it's next steps is the next one, sustainability. Sure. Thank you so much, Teresa. So I think, you know, again, taking all those points that, you know, Teresa mentioned, you know, I wanted to go back just briefly, you know, I think, you know, to your point, Teresa, you know, when we were putting this presentation and, and kind of talking with this, you know, Teresa said to me, you know, you know where you are, you know where you want to be. The question is, how do you get there, right? So that is our, you know, ask. And I know Neil's going to lead us into more of this conversation in a minute. But I think, you know, as we wrap up this echo, right, with all the discussions we've had, the information that we've shared, you know, it's really, you know, I think that next step of thinking about, okay, what are our next steps? You know, how do we continue to grow, you know, not just from, you know, numbers, but also in quality, right? How do we continue to grow our programs? And so really thinking about, you know, I always find, you know, within quality improvement and the work that I do, you know, again, I think having the steering committee, like Teresa mentioned, I think that's critical, right? Getting all those different players together to really talk about what implementation means, like if you're actually starting a lung cancer screening program and talking about first steps, roles and responsibilities are key to that, right? Who's doing what and how do we start? And then also, you know, putting a timeline, right? And a work plan together, you know, even if it's just very high level, right? But to be able to start those conversations, because as we all know, time passes so quickly. And I think to keep people engaged, and Teresa, you've mentioned this, a lot of you have mentioned this, you know, it's important to keep the work moving, right? It's great to have meetings, and it's great to plan these things, but unless we do that implementation phase, you know, we're going to lose enthusiasm. And, and, you know, I think, again, as we've all talked about, we all do this work as a you know, service to others, right? That's why we do this. That's why, you know, we're having this echo, you know, we want to provide quality lung cancer screenings to, you know, detect lung cancer screening early, right? Get our patients to treatment and be able to have them live longer, 
right? Quality of life. So again, just, you know, kind of thinking about all these components, you know, as we roll into this, this case presentation, you know, is really, again, to take all these different pieces. I also think Teresa's point of taking, you know, lung health. So, you know, how do we, you know, how do we, how do we really drill in on what matters to the patient, right? Because we all know about self-management and empowering and and way we do that through knowledge, right, for our patients. But I think we need to translate that sometimes and think of this in that same way. You know, what matters to them? Like Teresa mentioned, you know, what is lung health and how is that going to impact their quality of life, right? To engage them because as we've talked about in this echo, you know, getting that initial screening and then getting them back for subsequent annual screenings can sometimes be a challenge. So I think making that relevant and important to them is a way we can do that. So I'm going to stop at this point and also see um, if Neil has any comments to add and then if anyone else, you know, at this point has any questions for um, Teresa or myself. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll save my comments since we're going to do the case soon. Just... Yep. Let 